Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ray Gazine, and I'm uh, currently serving as Memorial's Vice President of Research. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to the St. John's campus and tonight's special lecture by our guest speaker, Dr. Gordon Laxer, Professor Emeritus from the University of Alberta. Tonight's event is one of the highlights of a symposium taking place this week at our university, presented by Memorial University and the Royal Society of Canada Atlantic. The theme of the symposium, asking the big questions, what might a, might, might a sustainable post-oil dependent Newfoundland and Labrador look like, and what kinds of skills, expertise, infrastructure, and institutions do we need to get there? I'm confident that Dr. Laxer will be offering interesting insights into the topic as he draws lessons from Alberta's oil dependence. I wish to acknowledge a key organizer of this week's symposium, Dr. Barbara Neese, a senior faculty member from Memorial's Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, who's here tonight. Dr. Neese is a university research professor in the Department of Sociology and is also a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and the Trudeau Foundation. So thanks, Barb, for all your work in organizing the events of this week. Before we begin, I'd like to take a care of a few housekeeping items. Uh, the washrooms are located just outside of the lecture theater's main doors. And I also ask you if you'd uh, please turn off your cell phones or adjust your ringers to silent mode. If you have any questions for Dr. Laxer, please hold them until the end of his presentation when we'll have time for a Q&A session. And uh, I invite everyone to join us outside for a small reception in the main foyer um, just outside the lecture theater after the discussion. And I understand that Dr. Laxer will have some of his books uh, there and will be uh, also happy to sign his books. So on with the introduction of our speaker. Dr. Gordon Laxer is a political economist and professor emeritus at the University of Alberta. He's the founding director and former head of the Parkland Institute, a nonpartisan research center which studies economic, social, cultural, and political issues facing Albertans and Canadians. Dr. Laxer is the author of five books, author or editor of five books, including After the Sands, Energy and Ecological Security for Canadians, which was nominated for the 2016 John W. Defoe Prize for Nonfiction Books. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Gordon Laxer. Thank you. Well, it's good to be here. Uh, can everybody hear me? This is uh, my second time on The Rock. Uh, I was here in 1979 with my young family. We did the whole tour from Porter Basque uh, uh, down to Argentia, um, uh, camping on the way. And uh, my wife lo uh, loved it so much, she said, you've got to apply for a job at, at uh, Memorial. Um, well, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Professor Nice, Barb Nice as well, for uh, organizing this and, and uh, inviting me. We met in 1980, I think it was, when we were graduate students uh, at the University of Toronto. Uh, and it's um, great to see her again. We haven't actually seen each other since, since those days. Um, well, I'd, uh, in every uh, province, uh, there, there's an alternating system between uh, pr uh, conservative and liberal governments and it you know, goes back and forth. I mean, that, uh, in Newfoundland is that way, and almost every province is that way. This has not been my experience. I lived for 68 continuous years under conservative governments. Um, now, the longest reigning dynasties in Canadian history were the Ontario Conservatives from uh, 1943 to 1985, and then Alberta from 1971 till 2015. So I grew up in Ontario, uh, spent my first 38 years there. And in 1982, when I saw that the Conservatives were faltering, I decided to move to Alberta to extend my stay for 30 years, another 30 years. Uh, and then a pattern ca uh, kind of emerged uh, where I, I, when I would leave a province with a Conservative dynasty, three years later, the government would be defeated. So that happened in Ontario. Uh, in 1985, and then I left Alberta in 2012, and they were defeated in 2015. So I told uh, Linda McQuaig about this pattern. I, you know, is this cause and effect? 
I, I told Linda McQuaig, who was an NDP uh, candidate in Toronto before the last federal election, about that, and she said, you better leave Canada right now. <laughs> well, we are living in uh, an epoch of great transition from an oil-based economy uh, to one of deep conservation and renewables. The future place of uh, oil in Alberta and Newfoundland, Labrador, must be seen in the context of this uh, transition. Will the two provinces be in the forefront of the shift to a low carbon future, or will they be left behind in a fossil fuel belt that may resemble the rust belts of the US uh, Midwest? So I'm gonna first look at the climate uh, change debate in Canada to provide the context. Well, last December, 174 uh, countries came together in Paris um, to uh, come up with a climate accord. Uh, and uh, there was very strong in aspirations, keep the uh, world's temperature uh, to a two degrees Celsius rise uh, above pre-industrial levels, or if possible, 1.5 degrees Celsius rise. But the Paris talks were very weak on delivery. Basically, they left it up to each country to determine its own national plan and, and to uh, submit its own targets. Um, so each country must uh, come up with an, a unique roadmap to reach its target. And despite Ottawa's um, uh, announced carbon uh, tax uh, last month, Canada does not have a comprehensive or credible plan and I outline a bold one in my book, After the Sands. We must change course. Uh, climate change is a very scary thing. Uh, for example, in uh, 2009, Mike Flanagan, who's a, a, sci a scientist with the Canadian Forest Service, said fires are burning bigger, hotter, faster, and more unpredictably. And climate change is the main reason why the area burned in Canada has doubled since the 1970s and is likely to double or triple in the next few decades. The Canadian uh, journalist Mark Lukash, who writes for the Guardian newspaper, uh, called Big Oil the arsonists of the Fort Mac fire. I'm not gonna say many good things about Big Oil uh, but I do care what happens to the sands workers, and I don't call it the oil sands or the tar sands, I just call it the sands. Uh, I care what happens to uh, those workers and their families and communities they live in, and we need a green transition to secure uh, their jobs for them and their families. So I wrote the book uh, to show Canadians how disastrous our present path is. Uh, and outline a strategy to remake Canada um, into a socially just, low-carbon future in the next two or three decades. It's ambitious, but it is what is needed. And my work complements the work of, of others, uh, uh, like Naomi Klein, This Changes Everything, and her documentary she made with her husband, uh, Avi Lewis, uh, also the, Leap, the inspiring Leap Manifesto, that adopts indigenous perspectives so well. But the, uh, my book uh, has a, a unique framing around the, uh, uh, around the issue of security, uh, and I'll explain that. So Canada's environmental policy is not credible. Uh, the carbon tax is not going to get us there. So I'm, I'm going to look at the uh, past of, of Canada's um, uh, uh, targets and, and look at, at the, the current one. So in um, 2002, Canada passed the Kyoto uh, Accord and they, uh, the, this was with the Krechan government, uh, pledged to cut Canada's emissions uh, by 6% below the 2012 level. Well, uh, instead they're up by uh, 18%, they were up by 18% by then. Well, what gives Canadians the right to spew 1.6% of greenhouse gases in the world when we have 0.5% of the world's population? That is more than three times our per capita level. So 
If you look uh, on the left side there, this was uh, the Kyoto target to reduce Canada's emissions from 576 megatons to, uh, to reduce it to there from 613. Well, instead, they were 715 megatons. Well, uh, uh, Prime Minister Harper decided, and, and Canada was the first country to do this, instead of using the 1990 base level, they moved it up to 2005, because then, you know, if you get near the goalpost, just move the goalpost back if you're not, if you're not reaching it. Um, so, uh, actually, before the Paris uh, talks, the Canadian government had to submit their plan, and they did it when uh, uh, Stephen Harper was still Prime Minister. So he, uh, the, his government uh, submitted the plan, and this was the plan. Reduce Canada's emissions below the 2005 level by 30% by 2030 to 524 megatons. Now, the Trudeau Liberals, uh, before the election, criticized these targets as inadequate, uh, but they have uh, since said, yes, those are our targets. Uh, so, and they're, mu they're much weaker than the um, uh, American and European Union targets. The Americans pledged to reduce emissions by 2.8% uh, a year, and the European Union as well, and, but Canada only by 1.7%. A year. So these are the feeble Harper Trudeau targets, and that's what I call them. This is Environment Canada has made this projection of where Canada's emissions uh, are likely to go. So if you look at the bottom right hand <coughs> corner, that is the feeble uh, uh, Harper Trudeau target, 524 megatons. Um, we're supposed to hit 622 in three years. But Environment Canada says there are these three scenarios, and this is where we're likely to go, which in fact is then an increase. Um, well, Eastern, um, Eastern Canadians are very oil insecure. Atlantic Canadians and Quebecers depend for most of their oil on imports. Um, yet NAFTA's uh, proportionality clause, how many people have heard of the proportionality clause? Yes, not very many. Canadians should be uh, aware of this. It's one of the most outrageous agreements that we've ever made. What it says is that Canada must, um, must export the same percent of its, uh, percentage of its energy to the United States as it has in the last three years, or, or put up on offer that, that percentage. So we export 70% of our oil and over half of our natural gas. Um, and now, if uh, corporations uh, uh, stop buying our, our energy, that's okay. But what isn't okay is if a Canadian government says, okay, there's an oil shortage, there's an international oil shortage, we are going to cut those exports because we have to supply Canadians. Now, uh, this is, now it, it's put in generic language, but it really only applies to Canada. Um, so it was in the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement of 1989, in 1994, when Mexico came in, Washington and Big Oil was very intent in getting Mexico to agree. They said, no way, this is a deal breaker. We would lose sovereignty. So Mexico got an exemption. It doesn't apply to the United States either because this is, we're talking about exports. And the United States is and will continue to be an oil importer. Uh, the Energy Information Administration in Washington says that the United States will uh, import a quarter to a third of all our oil in the next 20 years. Um, so basically, Canada's role is to help provide energy security for the United States, but not for Canadians, even though we are the cold country where people could freeze, could freeze in the dark. Um, well, um, so what we must do is, uh, and I put in a, a plan that, um, uh, you know, Americans no longer need Canadian oil to gain their energy security, but Eastern Canadians do. And so I talk about uh, replacing um, you know, oil imports, and it's 80% in Atlantic Canada, and just about 100% in Newfoundland. Newfoundlanders don't have access to their own oil because the refinery at Come By Chance doesn't, doesn't refine that oil. So if there was an international shortage, uh, Newfoundlanders would be in real trouble. Um, so now you may think, well, you know, we've been living through an era of oil glut 
uh, too much oil on the market to, compared to demand. That's why the price of oil uh, crashed. Uh, it's about half the level it was two years ago. It actually went down from $100 a barrel to $30 a barrel, uh, back up to about 50 now. But there, you know, and I certainly hope this doesn't happen, uh, but, but uh, I don't know uh, if you read in the paper three weeks ago, the U.S. Navy fired on uh, uh, Yemen, uh, and they, uh, the, the United States and Saudi Arabia back one side, Iran backs another side, and Yemen is very close to the Persian Gulf. Uh, the Persian Gulf, the Strait of Hormuz in the Persian Gulf uh, is very narrow. Oh, well, maybe I don't have that. I had it on a previous slide. Um, Yemen is just south of Saudi Arabia, um, and uh, if there was a, a wider war uh, between uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia, uh, the Strait of Hormuz could be shut off, and Atlantic Canadians, Newfoundlanders, uh, would, would be in real trouble, uh, not being able to get oil. Now, I think it's reckless of the Canadian governments and provincial governments to not have any plan to deal with this. Very reckless. Um, the, uh, the United States is always talking about energy security. Uh, they talk about energy independence. We import about the same percentage of oil as the United States does. Uh, they have a st the world's largest strategic petroleum reserve. We don't have one. Uh, Canada belongs to the International Energy Agency, which is the counterpart to OPEC. Uh, so it's it mainly the rich uh, consuming countries set up in 1974 after the, uh, the uh, international oil shortage of after the Yom Kippur War. And there are 29 countries in that. 27 of them have strategic petroleum reserves. Only Canada and Australia do not. Um, and uh, it's not a good idea to... Um, um, it, it's interesting that in the 1970s, uh, the Pierre Trudeau government uh, started to look at Canada setting up strategic petroleum reserves. Uh, and you know where they, they uh, found it was the cheapest and best spot on Bell Island, uh, the old abandoned iron uh, ore mine that uh, can take uh, tanker ships uh, way cheaper, uh, about 4% of the cost of building uh, uh, surface uh, um, uh, units for it. Um, so Canada should join with the rest of the world in framing eco-energy policies around security. In the carbon, for, uh, part, partly for the reason I've just said, because we're going to be living uh, and needing oil for the next two or three decades as we make the transition to a low carbon future, but also because as we move to a, a low carbon future, a carbon-constrained uh, future, uh, there's going to be less total energy overall. Uh, I don't think that renewable energy is going to have the same intensity as carbon fuels, and uh, my worry is that low- and middle-income people uh, will not have access to a sufficient amount of energy. If you leave price to determine who gets energy, uh, the rich and the military are likely to hog most of the supplies. So I'm advocating that um, the Canada recognize access to a sufficient amount of energy as a human right. Well, energy security and climate, uh, effective climate action are inseparable. We can't control our emissions if we allow unlimited growth and export of carbon fuels. Oil, and you know what the biggest source of uh, emissions are in Canada? It's from the production of oil and gas, not from transportation. All the vehicles in Canada do not have the, as many emissions as the production of oil and gas. Um, and to, uh, and that's, the, that's the fastest growing source is from the production of oil and gas. And to curb these, Canada must phase out Alberta's sands um, and all carbon fuel exports over the next 15 years. Canada has just enough conventional non-fracked oil and natural gas liquids to supply all Canadians, but not enough to continue with exports. So what my plan talks about is that uh, domestic non-fracked oil 
is, is falling, the, the production level. And I, I assume that it's going to continue to, to fall. And we have to have a strong conservation plan here to have our use fall at least as quickly as those supplies. Um, there is no good reason why Canadians, we waste so much energy. There is no reason why we use way more energy per capita than cold, equally cold, uh, unpopulated countries like Norway and Sweden. So for example, uh, Norway has uh, half the carbon emissions of Canadians per capita, the Swedes one third the level. Um, and the conservation principle is this. It's better to save a unit of carbon energy than to dig one up, emit it, um, and, uh, and uh, burn it. Well, I was in Edmonton in November when Rachel Notley uh, announced Alberta's climate plan before the Paris talks. Rachel Notley was a student of mine. I, I know her well. Um, and the, the, uh, the, the Notley government got great applause. It was quite a sight. Uh, the uh, CEOs of the four big sands oil corporations, the ones that I had fought for 30 years, stood uh, shoulder to shoulder with Premier Notley. And the CEOs had the widest smiles, so I smelled a rat. So here is uh, Premier Notley and her environment minister, uh, Shannon Phillips, uh, on her uh, to the right. And you can see uh, Brian Ferguson and others who are having the biggest smiles there of the big oil corporations. Um, and I could see why uh, the CEO smiled. Because Alberta's climate leadership plan is actually going to prevent Canada from re reaching its Paris targets, climate targets, the ones I called the pathetic ones of, of uh, Harper uh, Trudeau. Um, because what it does is it, it targets the 11% of emissions, of Albertans emissions that come from transportation, and the 17% that come from, elect, from electric, uh, gener uh, electricity generation. So that's in total 28%. It leaves almost scot-free the oil and gas production, 46%. Uh, and in fact, not only does it leave them almost scot-free, there's a, a small carbon tax put on them, uh, it allows them to grow by 43% between now and 2030. Uh, so while they are, um, uh, the province is uh, phasing out coal, and that is, that's a good thing, an important thing to do, uh, they, uh, it, that is going to be entirely ca counteracted. Any gains they, that are made in electricity generation and transportation canceled out by the growth in oil emissions from oil and gas production. So, uh, and this is from Alberta's own projections. Uh, that they are not going to reduce emissions by 2030. Um, so basically what they're asking, Alberta uh, government, and I went on the radio the next morning, I was in a, on a book, book tour, and I said, uh, really they're asking uh, ordinary Albertans at the gas pump and buying their electricity to reduce their emissions and to pay so that big oil can continue to grow uh, its production and its profits. Well, everyone knew that uh, the Alberta Conservatives were in big oil's pocket. The Rachel Notley government is plainly not. It was elected by progressive Albertans as an alternative. But the NDP government is intimidated by big oil. So being in the pocket of or intimidated by big oil leads to similar results. Now, the motivation is different. The Notley government is much more concerned with the sands workers than they are with, with uh, uh, big oil and its profits. Uh, but um, the NDP government is now urging the building of pipelines to a coast, to any coast, for the sake of national unity, as they call it. Of course, this is mainly the export, you know, the export of oil and mainly sands oil by big oil and mainly foreign-owned oil companies uh, I don't see how this is uh, 
it's anything to do with national unity. Um, but it's actually the message is more effective coming from, from Rachel Notley and the NDP because they're plainly not in big oil's pocket. Well, the Alberta emissions cap should be renamed um, Alberta's license to carbon pollute, and it will kill Jack Layton's dream. In 20, uh, 2008 and 2010, the House of Commons passed the Climate Change Accountability Act, sponsored by Jack Layton, to cut carbon emissions by 80 percent below 1990 levels by 2050. And the House of Commons passed it. This was the time of the Harper minority government. So the Liberals, the Bloc, and the NDP combined, they all voted for this. The Conservatives voted against, but were outvoted. Uh, but uh, uh, Mr. Harper got his unelected senators to defeat uh, this, uh, and it didn't become law. But it became very effective because the next year, when the G8 countries met in Italy, they all agreed to Jack Layton's plan, including Canada. So Canada is actually committed to uh, this, uh, this one. Um, and it's also had great um, um, uh, effect because Ontario, for example, its current climate plan uses uh, Layton's target. So uh, thank you, Jack Layton. Well, cutting um, Canada's 1990 uh, emissions uh, by 80 percent, let me look at the next. Uh, this, these numbers were uh, produced by David Hughes, who is a, geo was, uh, is a geoscientist. He was with the Geological Survey of Canada for 30 years, based in Calgary. Uh, David and I wrote a, an op-ed last uh, spring about this, but he's, he's the guy who produces the numbers. So here is the problem. If you look at those top numbers, that is what Canada committed to in Paris, and I, that's the ones I called the pathetic uh, Harper Trudeau target to bring down emissions to 524 megatons in 13 years. Now, if you look at the bottom part, you see oil and gas production, the emissions coming from oil and gas production uh, growing. So what it means is if we're going to meet though, that, those pathetic 2030 targets, we're going to have to cut all other uses of uh, carbon fuels by something like half in order for oil and gas production emissions to increase to that level. Now, if we get actually go on to 2050, remember I talked about Jack Layton's plan, reduce, and the, the G8 countries reduce emissions to um, uh, 123. If you, if you uh, cut it by 80%, that means that Canada can only emit 123 megatons by 2050. Now, if, if Alberta is allowed, with its oil and gas production, to increase its emissions to 100 megatons, it would take over 80% of Tana, Canada's total emissions. So, you know, people would have to stop uh, other kind of frivolous uses like driving to work, maybe heating their homes, just so big oil can increase its production and its exports and profits. Um, now, oil apologists say Canada's emissions are trivial. So why should we cut back? It's not going to make a difference. Uh, it's an ex that can be an excuse for just doing business as usual. And it's not true. Um, Canada is actually in the top, um, the top 10 uh, emitters. Here we are, 35th in, in, in the world in population. But we are in the top 10 countries in, in historical emissions and in the top 10 in current emissions. Uh, so we are batting way above our, 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 our weight and in a very negative way. Um, and it does matter historical emissions because they, they stay up, uh, the uh, CO2 stays up in the air for a very long time. So defenders of big oil will ask, why should Canada take significant action while China, you always hear the, the China example, builds all those coal-fired electric uh, generation plants. Well, that argument is falling apart. China is, uh, certainly is the biggest uh, greenhouse gas emitter, but it has the most people. 
And China is taking action that puts Canada to shame. Last year, nearly 100% of China's newly installed electricity was renewables, a record $110 billion they put into renewables. The Trudeau um, infrastructure plan talks about putting in $1 billion a year. So uh, on a per capita basis, China is doing three times as much. Um, China promises to have 200 gigawatts of wind and 200 gigawatts of solar power uh, by 2020. Now, th combined, that's enough to power 280 million homes for uh, over 800 million people, 60% of China's population. China's coal use fell 3.7% last year and 2.9% the year before. China has a long way to go, but it is making giant strides. And it plans to close 1,000 coal mines this year. So we have run out of China excuses to do nothing here at home in Canada. We must join the global move to a low carbon uh, society run on conservation and renewables. So uh, my book, uh, After the Sands, outlines a bold strategy of how to get there um, to, uh, in a way that it will ensure that uh, low income uh, and middle income Canadians have access to a sufficient amount of energy. Well, Prime Minister Trudeau promised big at the climate talks, Canada is back. But instead of going boldly forward, Ottawa took a baby step by planning to bring in a $50 uh, uh, a ton uh, carbon tax. And there was a, you know, it seemed to be a big deal because uh, three premiers walked out, in including the Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador and, and of Nova Scotia and Saskatchewan. Uh, but you know, it's, it's interesting uh, that the uh, Dwight Ball uh, uh, tax, uh, uh, revenue tax on gasoline is higher than, and if you renamed it the carbon tax, it's actually higher than Trudeau's carbon tax that will take six years to be implemented. Uh, so the, uh, the $50 a ton, what does that work out to? That works out to 11 cents increase uh, a, a liter uh, on gasoline, or two, two cents a year starting in 2018. Now, what is that gonna do? Uh, if you go back uh, two, two and a half years when the world price of oil was double what it is now, people were paying 30 or 40 cents a liter more, uh, just as a matter of course. So what is 11 cents gonna do? Did, did 30 or 40 cents more car curb carbon emissions significantly? No. Uh, so this is, seems to be the centerpiece. This, is, and pretending that Canada is doing anything at all, this is artful deception. The richest 10% um, of the world's people cause 50% of global emissions. So you take the rich in all of the countries in the world. And here's the problem with the carbon tax. To have a carbon tax high enough to curb their use, would be so high that low and middle income people would be stranded in unheated homes, freezing in the dark. The 1% and the 10% have no more right to emit into the Earth's common fragile biosphere than anyone else. Regardless of income, everyone must have the same right to clean air and drinking water and a resilient natural environment. So there's going to be less energy in a carbon-constrained future, uh, and we have to make sure that uh, we can't uh, ration that on the base of price, because you would have to increase the cost of uh, gasoline you know, to five or $10 a liter to get the well-to-do and the rich to start changing their behavior. So my book uh, outlines a fairer and much more effective way to reduce emissions of uh, of the rich and well-to-do than carbon tax or ca cap and trade. And the best way that I've seen is through personal uh, tradable energy permits or quotas, TEQs. And these were uh, pioneered in Britain, actually passed by the British Parliament in 2008. It's been very much examined in Britain, uh, not implemented yet, uh, as it was uh, called ahead of its time. Uh, it was very bad timing because 2008 was just when the uh, the great, the, the uh, 
financial crisis happened, the, the uh, Great uh, uh, Recession. Um, if you're, so these are called tra uh, tradable energy quotas, and you can go to the website uh, to read them. So what, what it does is it puts a hard cap on, th this is, this is a, these are national plans. You know, we don't have a world government, so this is uh, designed to uh, be done at the national level. So what it does is it says that there's a carbon budget for the, the country. This is how much we can em emit. And each year, like, a, like stairs, it is going to go down somewhat as, so that we get to a low carbon future. Um, but it, it actually allows uh, um, uh, flexibility uh, below that uh, of markets to, to distribute the quotas beneath that cap. So what they... Um, what it basically does is it gives individuals weekly carbon permits. Uh, and that is calculated when you buy energy, how much carbon is in that energy. So if you buy renewable energy, you, you, you know, you don't have any, you're not using up your carbon permits. But if you're using uh, carbon energy, then uh, if you use more than your, uh, your allotment, you're going to have to buy yours. There's a redistributive effect in this because uh, lower income people are unlikely to, to use all their permits. Um, but, and, and, and the rich can buy theirs, but as the, uh, the yearly budget of carbon comes down, the, uh, the, the, even the rich and well-to-do are going to have to change their behavior. The permits are given freely to individuals, but, but governments and industry have to buy theirs. Um, so anyway, this has been really uh, well studied in Britain. Uh, there was an all parliamentary committee in 2011, including uh, not only Labour and the Liberal Democrats, but the Conservatives, uh, and they very enth enthusiastically supported this. These ideas have gone to the European Union. Uh, we're not discussing this kind of stuff in Canada. We should be discussing things way beyond um, um, uh, carbon taxes. Um, well. Quebecers and Atlantic Canadians are energy insecure because they import uh, so much oil. Um, and it used to come from the North Sea and from the Middle East, and we're still getting a fair bit from the Middle East, but increasingly we're getting oil from the United States. Uh, now you may think that uh, that makes it more secure for Canada, but um, if you think that, think again. Um, Matt Simmons, uh, headed the, uh, the world's largest oil investment bank in the world, and he was an energy advisor to George W. Bush. I called him up, and he actually called me back. I, I couldn't believe it, <coughs> even without one of his handlers. And I said, what would happen to Canada if there was an international oil shortage? And he said, we would cut you off just like that. He said, uh, don't think you, you're going to get any oil from our strategic petroleum reserve. That's for us. Uh, so if you want energy security, do you use oil? You better b build your own uh, strategic petroleum reserves. And Canada is getting increasing amount of oil from the United States. The, the uh, train that tragically blew up at Lac Megantic, Quebec, was from North Dakota shale oil. Um, pipelines. Well, proposals for new pipelines ignite controversy and opposition. Uh, wherever they're proposed. And because they would lock Canada into uh, continuing to expand sands oil production and emissions, and they ca can cause environmental damage in many places. And of course, they run roughshod over the rights and lands of many indigenous peoples. The proposed uh, Energy uh, East pipeline, and it's been talked about, you know, as providing uh, energy security for this uh, region, and it, it's going to bring North American oil. Um, well, it, it's, an, it's an almost entirely a, an energy exporting pipeline. Mark Sherman, who is the plant manager at the Irving Oil Refinery in St. John, New Brunswick, said the Energy East line would send, quote, way more than we would ever use at this refinery, so the bulk of it would all be exported. Uh, so this is not, this is Alberta sands oil coming 4,600 kilometers across the continent to be exported. Um, now, uh, I was going to go into uh, pipeline history in Canada, uh, 
let me just say from the 1950s to the 1970s, they ran east-west, basically providing Canadians with Canadian oil, especially in, in uh, Western Canada and Ontario. From the 1980s to 2011, that's our second uh, pipeline era, they ran south. This coincided with the free trade, area, uh, free trade agreement with the United States and NAFTA. Uh, all the pipelines were built. Uh, Big Oil and the uh, uh, Alberta and the Canadian government got, were totally surprised when uh, Obama halted the Keystone XL pipeline in 2011, temporarily and then permanently in 2015. So that's when we heard about all these pipelines to coast. Find me a coast, any coast, so we can, instead of exporting to the US, we export to China and other places. So two proposals to the West Coast and Energy East uh, to New Brunswick. Um, well, the Energy East pipeline is to New Brunswick is not needed. Um, current pipelines from Canada to the Gulf Coast, <coughs> they've been built in the last two or three years. So actually, uh, all of uh, Alberta sands oil that, that, that the refineries there and the Gulf Coast wanted to import, get there, and they get there at the world price. Um, and uh, the other reason is that uh, much of uh, the oil price crash over the last two years have mothballed much of Alberta's future oil output. So almost half of all the oil projects canceled in the world in 2015 were in the Alberta sands. Um, so why run a pipeline 4,600 kilometers from Alberta when Newfoundland and Labrador have enough non-fracked conventional oil to supply all Atlantic Canadians? So most Atlantic Canadians live on or near a coast. Why not ship it to them uh, and rather than pipe it? And here is the reason. If you build a pipeline, and the Energy East pipeline will be, if built, the second most voluminous, capacious uh, pipeline in North America. 1.1 million barrels a day, and that can carry more than a quarter of all Canada's oil. If you, it's going to take 30 years to pay off the construction costs. You have to go full bore for the next 30 years, mainly exporting sands oil uh, in order to pay off the cost. So, you know, we're going to be going to 2046, 2047. How are we going to be getting off carbon uh, emissions and carbon fuel if we uh, are committed to that? The advantage of shipping it in from uh, offshore Newfoundland uh, is that you, as Canadians' use and Atlantic Canadians' use falls, as we, if, we, if we have a, a, a conservation plan, you can uh, phase out tankers. Uh, so you're not committed to this 30 years. Well, the era of oil's dominance is nearing an end. Until 2015, OPEC and Big Oil assumed that oil left in the soil would grow in value. But they're beginning to realize that it may be less, less valuable in the future. That's why Saudi Arabia is selling so much oil today, even though that holds down the international price, because it may be worth less in the future. Total, which is France's largest oil corporation, said, Quote, some fossil fuel reserves must remain undeveloped. We decided to reduce our exposure in Canada's oil sands. Uh, so more big oil is starting to move in that direction. And demand for oil is going to, we used to talk about peak oil, peak supply of oil. We're now talking peak demand for oil. Uh, so it, 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 people are predicting that, there, that we will, can reach uh, peak demand uh, within a few years. There's a number of reasons for that rising fuel efficiency standards that uh, most countries have brought in, uh, the move to electric vehicles. Norway, 25% of the vehicles bought in Norway last year were electric vehicles. Norway, which is a, a you know, major oil exporting country, has said that by 2025 you cannot buy, you will not be able to buy a fuel uh, powered car. You have to buy an electric car. China is moving strongly to electric vehicles. France is talking about this. And even if you take 2 million barrels of oil off demand, the price of oil is going to fall very significantly, and that's going to make it uneconomic to build new uh, projects in Alberta sands. You need a world price of $68 to $100 a barrel to make the new projects uh, 
um, uh, economic, profitable. Um, so uh, why build a pipeline? What I'm worried about is if that the pi energy use pipeline is built, it's going to become a white elephant, and uh, the, uh, it, it, it could easily go bankrupt. And guess who gets stuck with white elephants? It's the public who, who picks it up and the taxpayer. So Alberta's government and big oil are on the wrong side of history. They are betting that the age of carbon fuels will continue for decades, and that's unlikely. So Alberta must join, now join the international transition to a low carbon future or be left behind in a fossil fuel backwater of abandoned oil wells and tar ponds. Now is the time to get off carbon fuels. 50,000 workers were laid off in the sands last year, about 2.5% of Alberta's 2.2 million workers. Should Alberta try for another oil carbon fuel boom? Well, if, it, if by chance one happened, it would likely be, be uh, then followed by a permanent bust. So we should take the current oil bust as an opportunity to transition Alberta, Newfoundland, and Canada to a low carbon future. And how would we do this? Well, we need the deep conservation, as I've talked about, renewable energy. And there are many more jobs created when you save a unit of carbon energy than when you uh, dig one up, um, uh, burn it, and emit it. Uh, if you put a million dollars into oil and gas production, you get one job. If you put that same million uh, dollars in, you get eight jobs in construction. Most of the workers in Sands are actually construction workers. They could be, we could be retrofitting all buildings in Canada. We could be uh, building uh, high-speed trains in the provinces where uh, that is feasible. Uh, we could be building district heating like they have in, in, in Stockholm. Uh, uh, LRT, subways, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, so, you know, in every community, we could be saving a unit of carbon energy. So instead of flying, uh, having uh, nonstop flights from St. John's to Fort Mac, people could be in the home community saving units of carbon energy. Um, so this is, uh, oh yes, just, uh, these guys uh, work in uh, the, the sands, uh, and they've formed a group called Iron and Earth, uh, and they've just come out with a, a plan. You can look at it on, online. Uh, I haven't had a chance to read it yet because it just came out a couple of days ago. They want to retrain 1,000 electrical workers to work on 100 different solar projects. So these are actual uh, workers in the sands. And you know this is the kind of future that, that we need. Um, so Canada should adopt the, the following uh, principles. We've got to move to a, a just transition program for um, energy and construction workers in Alberta sands. We've got to replace all oil imports, phase out carbon energy exports, end NAFTA's proportionality clause, demand a Mexican exemption. Mexico's in NAFTA, and they are not subject. So we've got to pressure Ottawa. And Ottawa's got to have in its back pocket the six-month clause. Any, any partner in NAFTA can pull out after giving six months notice. Um, We've got to partner with indigenous, indigenous nations as sovereign peoples, respect their stewardship over their traditional lands, and adopt the indigenous worldview as the Canadian worldview. Almost all of the environmental victories in Canada in the last 40 years have been led by indigenous people. Um, so um, what a, electricity is going to be the new way of delivering uh, energy. And I'd like to see the hydro, the four hydro-rich provinces, this is British Columbia, Manitoba, Quebec, and Newfoundland, Labrador, help the other six uh, hydro-poor provinces get off coal-fired electricity, natural gas, even uranium, uh, and, but only supply it if they're under the, that understanding that they're going to get off that. Um, Newfoundland uh, uh, and Labrador um, uh, could supply 95% of the electricity in Atlantic Canada. The, uh, the cable to uh, Cape Breton is a good idea. Uh, it, that's a great start at that kind of thing. Um, but it, you know, it should be when uh, wind and solar produced anywhere in Atlantic Canada, including the Maritimes, could go the other way to Newfoundland. But it should be 
I'd like to, you know, as a region, I think the region would be stronger if, they, if the four governments acted in common cause. Um, uh, I won't speak about Muskrat Falls right, well, let me just say that new dams uh, cause more greenhouse gases than was previously thought. Uh, so there is a problem in building new dams. But I think we should be using the old dams and adding in solar, wind, tidal power onto that. And they work actually very well together. Um, OK, I'm going to, um, my transition plan to get Canada to a low carbon future gives much importance to uh, this province's uh, non-frac conventional oil and uh, as the energy powerhouse of Atlantic Canada. So I'm going to compare Alberta and Newfoundland. Um, uh, you know, I know more about, about Alberta, so um, you, you have the, the much more knowledge of uh, Newfoundland and Labrador. But, you know, this province has been dependent on, on uh, oil for a much shorter period than Alberta. But the international oil price collapsed two years ago actually has hit Newfoundland harder in many ways. Um, Alberta fr first produced oil in 1902, but remained a poor a rural province until 1947 when a big oil find was in, uh, in Leduc. Um, and oil transformed Alberta into the, a richer and oil dependent economy where it remains today. Now, oil was uh, widely uh, anticipated in uh, Newfoundland Labrador for several decades before the first flow in Hibernia in 1997. Um, both Alberta and Newfoundland uh, have attempted to diversify their economies uh, beyond oil, and they've gone into other kinds of resources, uh, you know, in this province, uh, mining, uh, hydro. Uh, there used to be forestry and, and fishing uh, were mainstays, and, uh, but they have declined. Um, now, I, I heard some good things uh, from Doug about, uh, the, well, the revival, somewhat revival of the, the fishery, and I hope that happens. Um, the problem is when an oil boom is on, that's where the money wants to go. Uh, why go into something else? Because you can make the big, biggest profits there. When there's a bust, people want to diversify, but where's the capital then to do that? that, that that's the, the classical um, staples uh, dilemma. Um, in an oil bust, uh, both Alberta and Newfoundland governments face huge deficits, and they have both collected very low royalties, very low by international standards uh, and other kind of uh, revenues from oil, and they have not collected enough taxes in order to pay for basic public services, um, like health care and education. So under a neoliberal's um, ideology, today's dominant creed, most governments have drastically cut corporate taxes and progressive taxes on the rich. Uh, so revenues are insufficient to pay for public services. Um, when Newfoundland uh, got its, uh, its oil, it started to cut taxes as well as uh, reduce the debt. I'm talking 10 years ago. Um, most provincial governments have given up on Keynesian wisdom of using government spending to counteract the wild boom bust swings of the private sector in a, a resource-based uh, economy. When I was in Alberta, the uh, conservative governments, they used a pro-cyclical policy. So when uh, there was a, a boom, that's when they would build infrastructure. And of course, it increased the cost incredibly. You build a school, a road, it would cost because you would be competing with the private, the private sector for labor and other things. And then when the, the bus came, they would lay off thousands of teachers and nurses. And then when the boom came again, then they wondered why they couldn't bring back these nurses and teachers, you know, they had left. These were, you know, these were people. This wasn't something you just turn on and off with a tap. And it made the bust way worse. People had to move out. Um, so the, the uh, Rachel Notley government, and this one, and uh, I've been critical of it, but in this case, they have uh, courageously avoided this folly in contrast to Newfoundland's radical slash and burn budget of last spring. Um, the Alberta NDP won the May 2015 election after 44 straight years of conservative rule. Uh, 
by promising to run four years of deficits so it could invest in public infrastructure and keep people employed during uh, Oral's uh, downturn. Now, if that sounds, uh, you know, so it, um, it went against the no deficits orthodoxy, and it was a winning formula. It's interesting who picked up on that winning formula. Uh, Thomas Mulcair was running uh, as leader of the NDP three months later, and he did not adopt that. He adopted a, a kind of Harper Light balanced budgets uh, timidity, which then lost their initial lead in the election. And it was the Trudeau Liberals who picked up the NDP's uh, formula in Alberta of running uh, deficits, promising for four years. The latest uh, Marneau uh, uh, update actually says it's going to go beyond four years, but that was the promise in the election. And by being bold, the Trudeau Liberals won on that NDP uh, uh, strategy. Um, Royalties, I'm going to talk, rent, I'm near the end here of my talk. Um, economic rent is nature's bounty that is owned by the people of a country or region through its government. Uh, and it's, you know, it's calculated by the price that you can get, say, for oil, and the cost of, of producing that oil. Well, natural economic rents are really uh, non-renewable depletion charges, and they're part of a country or a region's patrimony. Um, uh, Alberta had a, a royalty review in 2007, uh, and the head of it, Bill Hunter, said, as Albertans, we own 100% of the resource, and we should expect nothing less than 100% of the rent. It's up to industry to convince us why we should take a decrease. Uh, Bill Hunter was no radical. He was appointed by the Conservatives, and he had been president of the Alberta Pacific Forest Industry Corporation. Uh, well, unfortunately, the... Uh, Governments since then did not uh, um, uh, raise royalties on that basis. And even the NDP who ran in the uh, 2015 election wanting a royalty review had the royalty review and then said, oh, the royalties are fine the way they are, which is at a rate that is below that of uh, Texas, Wyoming, Alaska, and far, far below that of Norway. And Newfoundlands aren't any better. Um, Despite the crusading image of Danny Chavez Williams, Newfoundland's royalty rate is an extremely low 1% to 7.5% of gross revenue. Um, Jim Stanford, I don't know if you know of Jim Stanford, an economist you see on The National, um, he wrote that uh, in 2008, profit margins in the petroleum and finance sectors are around 20% of sales. Profit margins in the rest of the Canadian economy average 6% of sales. On a per employee basis, the petroleum industry generates a stunning 300,000 worth of profits per worker per year. The rest of the economy generates an average of $10,000 per employee. And he goes on, the disconnect between a corporation and its home region is greatest for Newfoundland, which comes off looking like a winner. As a share of GDP, profits are higher in Newfoundland, an incredible 32% than in any other province. An awfully large chunk of that money never sets foot in Newfoundland. It represents profits from offshore oil production, collected and repatriated back to head offices of the companies producing that oil. And this largely explains the odd disconnect between Newfoundland's high GDP per capita, which is higher than the Canadian average, and its low personal incomes, which are well below the personal average, the, uh, the national average. Well, Alberta faces uh, two choices. Uh, stick with the staples and attempt to ride another oil boom, uh, or uh, plan to phase out Alberta sands, ban the fracking of oil and natural gas, and plan a path to a low carbon future. The second path is the only way to deal with a world that's moving to this low carbon future. Peter Lougheed, who was the father of modern, who was really the father of modern Alberta and the province's conservative dynasty, said water is Alberta's most important resource. I can imagine an Alberta without oil, but not without water. The same can be said, of course, of Newfoundland Labrador. For landlocked Alberta, uh, Lougheed was referring to fresh water for Newfoundland, the sea is perhaps more important. 
Well, Alberta can make the transition off carbon fuels by following its own example of getting off coal-fired electricity. Alberta has certain advantages to, to make that transition, and uh, Newfoundland Labrador has other advantages. Um, one of Alberta's major ad advantages is it's got two cities, Calgary and Edmonton, with well over a million people. And so it's got a, a large enough market to have diversity. There are, you know, if you look at the top seven uh, employers in, in Calgary, many of them are non-oil uh, companies. Uh, the biggest is Shaw Communications, um, Nova Chemicals is second, TELUS, Mark's Work Warehouse is third, Calgary Co-op is fourth, uh, the CPR, WestJet. So, you know, there is a certain diversity of the economy. But, um, and Alberta also has net assets of over $30 billion, which, uh, uh, you know, Newfoundland uh, Labrador does not. Um, but Newfoundland and Labrador actually have advantages. Um, um, Alberta has to get off its, its uh, uh, carbon fuel electricity, both coal and natural gas, whereas Newfoundland has all of this renewable energy in dams, and it can add in other renewables into that. It also, Newfoundland and Labrador has uh, conventional, uh, non, mainly conventional non-fracked oil, whereas Alberta has to get off the dirtiest of oils, uh, the sands oil. So in many ways, uh, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador is, uh, is in a good position to move to the next uh, uh, energy paradigm, economic paradigm, the low carbon future. Uh, and it matters uh, if they, you know, you seize the chance here. Um, the lesson from Al Alberta, okay, what are they very quickly? Um, collect much higher royalties, save them in a fund that is uh, uh, for use in a post-oil times. Do not use revenues from royalties to fund ongoing public services. Uh, exact, um, enact non-royalties taxes high enough to pay for all public services. Practice counter-cyclical rather than pro-cyclical policies. Move off resource mega projects as the primary economic strategy. Um, Conservation and micro-renewables would be good. Use government to do the things that are necessary to enable people to move um, uh, off carbon energy, uh, retrofitting all buildings, densify St. John's, walkable streets, intertown bus services, safe cycling lanes, reduce the political power of big oil and the oil, oil dependence on the oil industry, um, and um, build up a renewable energy sector uh, that can be, and workers who work for it, who can act as a counterweight to the power of big oil. Uh, transition, the transition involves a cultural, a big cultural change. Um, greater connection to nature, shorter work week. And the transition is, reshuffles the deck. If a region uh, has been disadvantaged in the past, we are gonna be making a kind of slow revolution uh, regions which were behind could be in the forefront if they, if they seize the chance. Um, so I'm just going to finish that um, Atlanta, Canada is at a crossroads. Uh, should it count on the era of oil dominance and carbon resource exports continuing or um, break out of that? Rather than allow the region to be directed and neglected by powerful outside forces that care little about the fate of its people, Atlantic Canadians can fashion their own future more. And one way to do that is to bring the, draw the four provinces together in more in common purpose. Um, and Newfoundland, Labrador, and the Maritimes are in a more fortuitous position than most parts of the world to make that successful uh, transition. And to do so, the area has to stop pinning its hopes on outside forces to bring it economic well-being. That's it.